Hello, I'm Gary Imlac and this is the story of the 2002 Tour de France, starting here in Luxembourg, the Tour's first foreign start for four years. In cycling terms, of course, it might as well have been Texas. Lance Armstrong came into this race as a huge favourite to join the exclusive club of riders who've won four tours, and the even more exclusive club of riders who've won four straight. Trying to win as many tours as Miguel and Eddie and Ancatil and Copi and, and these guys, those aren't my motivations in life. Those aren't my motivations in sport. My goal is to be happy and to be successful and to work hard and to, and to earn my money and to prove that it can be done. And that's a year by year thing. On the subject of this year's thing, Armstrong, in public at least, disagrees with those who are already printing up the Lance Makes It Four t-shirts in preparation for Paris. For some reason, I think this will be the hardest of the, of the last three, the last four. I think this will be tough. I think we'll see depth in teams, depth in the field that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that's why I'm just thankful that we have such a strong team, because I, I think that you're going to see the Olsens and the Kelmes and the Benestos, uh, the Kofidises. I mean, you're going to see strong teams with three or four guys in the climbs that make life hard. As an endurance event, the Tour is rivaled only by Armstrong's relationship with the French public. They haven't exactly clasped him to their collective bosom over the course of three Tour wins, so it's unlikely that a fourth will make a difference. It's sometimes frustrating because you see riders they accept, riders they really cherish and love and cuddle and, and scream for, and it's the guys that in the group you say, I don't ever want to be like that guy. <laughs> I mean, it's just, no offense, but I want to be the guy that just keeps his mouth shut, works hard, is true to his team, true to his family, true to his sport, and gives a full effort and wins the race. That's the guy that I want to be. I don't want to put a flower on my head or take a picture or, 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 or do a song and dance. I just want to be a sportsman and win the biggest bike race in the world. And that's what you kind of hope that the people on the roadside say, look at there in French. They would say, Chapeau, look at the guy. Trained harder than anybody else, wanted it more than anybody else, and he got it. Well, the big question is whether anyone can stop Armstrong getting it for the fourth straight year, and the pre-race consensus seems to be probably not. But then people say that about every great tour champion until the year that it actually happens, and there are certainly riders in the race capable of rattling Armstrong's bottle cage. Hello and welcome to the 89th edition of the Tour de France, which next year will celebrate its centenary. Now that may sound strange, but of course the World War years interrupted the progress of this race. We go back in fact to 1903, when the smoking chimney sweep, Maurice Garin, won the very first Tour de France. Oh, my goodness me, what a long way this race has come. It's now more popular than ever. I'm Phil Liggett, joined of course by my pal Paul Sherwin in commentary now as we look at this year's Tour de France. It started in Luxembourg and it hasn't been there since 1989. On that occasion, Pedro Delgado was the defending champion. This year, of course, it's the American Lance Armstrong and he's a hotter favourite than ever, Paul. Well, before the start, Armstrong is the number one favourite. I don't see anybody else challenging him. But I actually asked him how he thought this was going to be, this fourth attempt to try and win the event. Well, he said the first win was really my comeback. The second win was confirmation. The third was absolutely just for pleasure. The fourth one is going to be the most difficult one to win. I think he's right, and it is a very unusual course this year, and we'll explain more of that in a moment. But it's not just about Lance Armstrong from America this time around. There are other riders now from America leading the foreign teams. For example, Tyler Hamilton, CSC from Denmark, and you've got Levi Leipheimer, first tour for him, and looking very good after his tour of Spain last year. 
and also finishing well in the Route du Sud just before the Tour de France starts. He's a great challenger. I think maybe just a little young to come to the Tour de France for the first time and hope to lead a team to get himself onto the podium. But it will be interesting to follow his progress over the big mountain stages and, of course, in the individual time trials. But let's not forget two other American riders, two men riding for Team Telecom, with the possibility of riding their own race, Kevin Livingston and Bobby Julik. Yeah. Good point, because of course Jan Ulrich not here, out all year with injury and not having a very good season at all. The Tour Prologue is a bit like the first day of the cricket season. There's no relying on the weather and a damp start in Luxembourg meant one more worry for the riders on top of a tight technical course with cobbled sections and a sharp climb to the finish. But as we join the action, Kelme Santiago Botero, one of the genuine challengers to Lance Armstrong, was bearing down on it. There's the clock now. So Santiago Botero, they were all right to worry about this man. You best time and a good one. Nine minutes and 12 seconds. And now back here, we're looking behind the scenes here. Young man is passing Lance Armstrong a drink. And Lance Armstrong very politely, I think, there, just saying no thanks, not for the moment. Raimundus Rumsas is coming up to the line right now. A very impressive time by him as well, as we get another champion in the starting gate, Christoph Moro. And Romzas has done another great ride here, the Lamprey boy. It is going to be the best time. Now, we are a little bit surprised. He's a great time trial, but I really didn't think that he was going to get inside the time of Botero. Well, the organisation normally provide a skin suit yellow jersey kit, but Armstrong has decided to stay with his team colours, the former world champion. The man has won the Tour de France three times. It's his right, and he's chosen now to give it his best shot. Armstrong is a brilliant prologue rider. He's proved to that in the past, and he came back after his terrible ordeal with cancer. He won the prologue. He went on to win the Tour de France. Once again, he started in a big gear, but look at this cadence. He's up around 100, 105 revolutions for every minute. This is quite remarkable as we rejoin at the front of the race. You can see the performance of Christophe Moreau coming into the last 500 meters. In a moment or so, we should get the time check for Lance Armstrong, the last man on the road of the opening prologue today. This is going to be a special ride from Laurent Jalabert here. He is going to challenge the leaderboard of Raimundus Rumzas. And look at the face set here. Bjorn Aris is his trainer. There's the time. Can he produce the sprint and shock us all? We never thought of Laurent Jalabert to win the prologue. He is getting all the cheers of France. He's on top of the board. 9, 10.52. Paul, it's time for the experts to leave, I think. Well, we're looking at Lance Armstrong now. Can he pulls something special out of the bag and take away the prologue victory and the first yellow jersey in the Tour de France and this man is unbelievable when he turns up the power and we know he's got that power we still believe he could pip uh, Laurent Jalabert on the line he is the only man left on course who can possibly do it now Jalabert is the leader Romzas is second Batero is third David Miller is fourth Laurent Brochard is fifth that's the order in now, can this man upset it and Pierce either win or finish second? This is going to be close and it might well yet be the winning ride. Armstrong is coming down this finishing straight like a Grand Prix motor car. He is powering up here. There is a USA flag blocking off you right now, but Armstrong and everybody here is banging on the boards and shouting his name as he races towards the line. It is going to be close. It is going to be a desperate sprint for the line, and he is going to get it. Lance Armstrong has won the prologue. 9, 8.78. How on earth did he do that? So confirmation, both of the result and all his rivals' worst fears. Lance Armstrong with an opening day statement of intent. Still only two seconds ahead of Laurent Jalabert, who put in an even better performance, really, when you consider what he was expected to do. Lance, congratulations on the yellow jersey. Are you going to defend it for the rest of the uh, first half of the race? I don't know. We have to see. It's We have to evaluate all options and see what happens with time bonuses and breakaways. But... We'll see tonight. I have to talk to the team. That's right. You're not going to be dazzled by the, uh, the great record of uh, wearing the yellow jersey from start to finish? Uh, that would be, I think, a mistake. It's better to, to try to wear this jersey in Paris and, and be smart along the way. If you have to give it away for a few days, then we'll do that. So, seven kilometers down, just the 3,270 and a half to go. Let's take a look at the route now as it's going to unfold over the next 22 days.
Following the prologue, there's another circular stage to make sure Luxembourg gets its money's worth. Then a quick detour into Germany, where the telecom team will be under orders to pace Eric Zabel into position for a home win. Inevitably, after three tour victories, the route is littered with good omens for Lance Armstrong. When the race finally hits France, it's in Metz, where he took the race lead for good in 1999. This time, it's a stage start on the way into Champagne country, providing that extra incentive for the day's winners. A couple of bottles on the team manager's table, and the riders allowed to sniff the cork as a special treat. The team time trial switches the focus from the stars to their supporting casts. A crash cost US Postal time last year, but the big onus is usually on the team of the yellow jersey holder not to lose it for him. Stage four marks the start of a high-speed chase across northern France for the sprinters, culminating in the first acid test of the tour. Lactic acid, that is. Stage nine is a 55-kilometer individual time trial along the coast at Lorient. By the end of it, you should have a clear idea of the strength of the defending champion and his challengers. French air traffic control permitting, the riders then head south to Bordeaux for a day's rest before the mountains. Since it's an anti-clockwise year, that means the Pyrenees first and massive support for the Spanish climbers. A punishing first day over the Col d'Obis and up to La Mangie is followed by a five-climb monster on stage 12, finishing at Plateau de Bay, where Marco Pantani won four years ago. There's usually a couple of days respite between the Pyrenees and the Alps. This year, though, features a return to possibly the most feared climb in cycling, Mont Ventoux. Lance Armstrong gave this stage away two years ago and he's regretted it ever since. He'll be desperate to take the win. After the second rest day, it's on to the Alps, starting with Lake Deux Alpes, where Jan Ulrich famously cracked and lost the tour in 1998. Then it's on to another mountain finish at La Plagne via the Col de Madeleine, where Armstrong fooled everyone that he was cracking last year. Depending on the mountain stages, the time trial to Macon will either be the final showdown final flourish. Then all the survivors can relax and roll into Paris. Now Lance Armstrong isn't the rider who gets carried away by romance very much. He's usually fairly calculating when it comes to winning bike races. Still the inescapable fact was that he had the chance to go into history as the first rider since Romain Mice in 1935 to wear the yellow jersey on the tour from start to finish. The course is a 192.5 kilometer loop around Luxembourg, but the interesting thing to look at is the profile. Two third category climbs, two fourth category climbs, and the same uphill finish that had the veins bulging on the rider's faces yesterday. That could suit either Laurent Jalabert, an ex-sprinter who can climb, or David Miller, whose impressive fifth place on a tough course yesterday was good enough to give him the white jersey of the best young rider in the race. The question is, will he be slipping into something more yellow later on? Well, there are time bonuses of 20, 12 and 8 seconds for the first three riders placed on today's stage, so it's certainly possible. I don't know. It's, it's going to be really unpredictable today. I mean... Um... I don't think Lance is going to want to protect the jersey that much. I mean, you never know with Lance. You never, honestly, you never know. But um, I think either a break is going to go, or it's going to split in the final, or the sprinters' teams are going to control it. There's about three or four different scenarios that could happen, and um, they're all fairly equally balanced. You know, it could be a break, but it depends. It depends how much the sprinters' teams want the yellow jersey, because they're not that far off uh, off Lance. So if they go for the bonifications and stuff, they can take the yellow. But it's a hard day today, so. We'll Listen, if, if a group does go away, are you interested in trying to get into that breakaway? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll go for yellow jersey today, why not? You know, I've got nothing better to do. <laughs> Lance Armstrong was doing his impression of a French presidential candidate at the start, kissing babies, well, kissing his own, and saying nothing of any real substance. That job fell to the youngest rider in the race, 22-year-old Jérôme Pinot of the Bonjour team, who was nominated before the stage to take the rider's oath of ethical competition and fair play. As the riders rolled out on the first road stage of the tour, 
There was word from the US postal camp that Lance was happy to let his rivals make the running. And they duly started to make it. Heading for the first sprint of the day was Armstrong's closest challenger, Laurent Jalabert, in the green jersey. Along with the two big rivals for the points competition, Eric Zabel and Stuart O'Grady. Zabel, celebrating his 32nd birthday, took it ahead of O'Grady and Jalabert. But Jalabert's two-second time bonus made him now the race leader on the road by two-tenths of a second. Stage one was turning into a nightmare for Christophe Moreau, who'd managed to get involved in his second crash of the day. And it really wasn't the kind of stage that you could afford to. The action up at the front was relentless. And after the initial three leaders were caught, along with the bunch that had chased them down, there was another attack with nine kilometres left. A group of six riders were trying to put significant distance between themselves and the main bunch. And this is Axel Merckx, who's spearheading the drive. This is this could be a significant move. Look at the daylight that's formed behind. Well, this is a good move. What they need to do now is concert their effort, work hard, try and build up an advantage of 20 or 30 seconds, because then in the main field, the riders behind will start to ask themselves questions as to whether or not they need to put in that effort this. to get themselves a stage victory. There is a big gap there right now. Some pink jerseys starting to appear at the front end of the main field. And what we do have to ask ourselves is Eric Zabel still in the pack? Well, this is a most intriguing move. It was the long, the thin legs there of Eddie Merckx's son, Axel, who pulled them away from the group. Bogart was very willing to have a go and take it away. This is Sergei Ivanov here as well. And this is an enormous gap right now. Might well be the move big gap over the main peloton right now you just noticed that Michael Bogard went to the back of that group there he was trying to encourage Sergei Ivanov to come forward they don't want any passengers at the moment that everybody has to work in this group if they're going to survive over the main field Michael Bogard looks to be the man with the best legs in the group at the moment and it is going to be a very explosive finish the referee going by there, giving a time check, giving the numbers of the rider in this lead, leading breakaway. There are six men leading right now with an advantage of 15 seconds over the main field. Four kilometres to go, that's around about six minutes. And the gap surely isn't enough, but there is the climb at around two kilometres, slight, no, around one kilometre to go, it's two kilometres uh, uphill this. There's the peloton. Now, Landis is in a very good position because on his team is Lance Armstrong, the race leader. His instructions are simple. Go with the move, but don't assist it to escape. He has every reason to become the passenger, and if he's got the legs, he could even go alone. Eight seconds to go. Welcome to Deutsche Telekom, the team of Eric Zabel. The job is now on Zabel's birthday to hunt down the breakaway and get the present ready. Stephen Weisserman on the front there. Fourth position just going out of the picture was Rolf Aldag. This is Udo Boltz. Boltz was brought in at the last moment to ride for this team telecom when Vinukarov, one of their big favourites, had to withdraw because of an injury due to a crash in the Tour of Switzerland. The chaos is there in the main field. These guys are still surviving. There are six men at the front of this bike race, Phil. The last time check was just eight seconds. That is not very much more than 100 metres. <laughs> Paul, well, sorry, <laughs> there it is. It's not even that, mate. It's all over. Telecom, Deutsche Telecom have shut down the breakaway at the three kilometres to go. After this wonderful day's racing, it is again all together. Those with the legs that are one or two behind now, but basically all of the feel that matters is here. Laurent Jalabert on the left-hand side in the green jersey. At the moment, as we look at this bike race, he is the leader of the race by two-tenths of a second from Lance Armstrong in the count back to yesterday's prologue time trial. But if Eric Zabel goes across the line in first place, my quick calculations has Eric Zabel winning this bike race and taking the overall lead by a mere second. Aldag on the front right now, the big, tall, lanky figure. He's a great bike rider to have in your team. We've seen him many, many years riding for this team. There, up into third position, Stefan Weissemann. A quick chat back to the overall team manager at the back, Rudy Pavanage. He wants to know how things are unfolding at the moment. Eric Zabel off to the right-hand side on his work wheel is a green and white jersey. That is Stuart O'Grady. It is definitely going to be an O'Grady-Zabel battle for the green jersey domination all the way to Paris. Will it be a battle between the two of them today? There are two kilometres to go. They are thundering into the streets of the city of Luxembourg. And Telecom are doing what they do best, control the race at the front. For Ralph Aldag on the front, this is his eighth Tour de France, but his first one since 1998. 
Second position there, Bobby Julik. Bobby Julik, a man who hopes he can ride high in the overall standings later on in the Tour de France, but today he has to work as a teammate. He is the man who's got to keep the pace as high as possible. There is Julik in second position there right now. We're on the incline now. It's around about one and a half kilometer to the summit. It is a long, difficult climb. Look at the men lining up now in front of Eric Zabel. There is the champion of Germany, Danilo Hondo. There is Fanini. There is Zabel. It's 20 seconds, Phil, for the first man to cross the line 12 seconds for the man who finishes second and eight seconds for the man who finishes third those point seconds are going to be so important at the end of today also moving forward robbie McEwen, your favorite from australia he's got a huge chance today if he can hang on that now the telecom boys are finding this climb is a little bit distressing because it, it's a lovely road surface it'll turn right towards the top and then we'll line up for the finish this is tremendous pacemaking being done here and the man doing it is Andy Flickinger, a Frenchman on the AG2R, but he's got no team around him, so he may as well move out. He's done that. The champion of Germany now, Danilo Hondo, and they'll do it one by one here, go as quickly as they can, lose their position and hope that the last man left on the front is Eric Zabel. But he's very closely marked by the sprinters, and there's always the trouble that somebody will slip away, and there's a move on the right, and it is again a Lamprey rider giving it just about everything. This is the time when the team must not panic at all. Danilo Hondo has got back into the saddle here. Look at his eyes fixed on the Lamprey rider who has launched out on the attack. But well, that is an unbelievable move by Team Lamprey coming out of the pack. Well, I think it is Belas Vosic of uh, Latvia who's gone from the Lamprey team. Now, if he's got the legs, can he hang on? Because he hasn't got much more strength left there. The peloton are still shadow boxing here if they can. But he's clear as he's come over the brow of the hill, he is holding it, and it's Bertogliati, we think, Rubens Bertogliati, it may be. Now, I think he was down in a crash earlier today, over the top. Those legs must be screaming with pain now. The telecom riders are still holding the back of the sprint as best they can. Well, he really has hit them hard, and they, in fact, it looks as if the wind has come out of the sails there for Team Telecom. On the front, Fanini, second place, Zabel, then O'Grady, then McEwen. They're into the finishing straight right now. The acceleration is coming on for the main field, but he may well have hit them just at the right time. He's hoping to survive his 300 metres to go. Well, this could be the steal of the day and richly deserved because we've seen a tremendous day of racing. But, you know, there's still the acceleration of the sprinters now as Baden Cook is trying to get in on the scene. The other Australian newcomer to the Tour de France now. The clash of swords. The legs are going, but it's too late. He's got victory on the line and Zabel and McEwen take the second and third. But a great, great win there. And we still think that the rider was Rubens Bertogliato. But what a dramatic finish and what a way to hit the main field on that climb up to the finishing line. This was the moment, Phil, when he knew he got it. It's a very difficult last 300 metres and Rubens Bertogliati comes up to the line here. He's given it everything. Those legs, you can be absolutely certain, are burning all the way to the line. And he gets back down into the saddle here knowing he's just got to keep it ticking over a little bit more. He knows how quick these men come up behind him. And there, Zabel wanted the win on his birthday right now and he just has to settle for second place ahead of Robbie McEwen. And there is the stage result. Not a 1-2-3 scene often in international cycling, but Toliati Zabel McEwen with Oscar Freire up contending in his first tour and Stuart O'Grady sixth. The big guns all rolled in together in the main bunch, so no time gaps there, except for Christophe Moreau, who I think it's safe to say is no longer a contender in this tour. He finished 139, three minutes 20 down, after crashing twice and finishing the race on a borrowed bike. And if the stage result was a surprise, what about this? Batoliati catapulted into the yellow jersey by the 20-second win bonus. He'd started the day 17 seconds behind Lance Armstrong, who slipped to third on fractions of a second behind Laurent Jalabert. Santiago Botero and David Miller were both bumped down a place into fifth and sixth. The yellow jersey in waiting, though, looks like Eric Zabel, who moved up ominously into eighth place just ten seconds back. Everyone else stayed in touch with the leaders, except Moreau. Good evening from Saarbrück, and the Tour de France took a half-day detour into Germany today, and the most prolific rider in German history was looking to take the lead. It's going to be 
a very tight finish indeed as Blyleben also from Zorbel gets it on the line. He's being challenged right on the line. He's going to be very close, but Zorbel gets it. You won't catch Eric Zorbel now. He'll just look at you and ride to the line. Zorbel wins it on the line. Through the middle comes Eric Zorbel in a green jersey on the line. That's it. Eric is in green. On the line, Zorbel gets it. Happy birthday, Eric. He takes it on the line. With six straight wins in the points competition and 11 stage victories, Eric Zabel is an authentic tour legend and he was the big favourite to win stage two here in Zabrucken and take the yellow jersey. Mind you, he'd also been a big favourite yesterday until Rubens Batoliati made a perfectly timed blindside run out of anonymity and into the race lead. The stage to Zabrucken was 181 kilometres, entering Germany about 54 kilometres in. There were three sprints along the way worth six, four and two seconds to the first three riders across. Well, that quickly became a moot point because Sylvain Chavanel of the Bonjour team attacked just 11 kilometres into the stage. He was joined by Ajay Desert's Stefan Bergès, a driving force in yesterday's break, and Tor Hushoft of Credit Agricole. Three riders well down the overall standings, and they began to mop up all the bonuses. They were the first men across the border into Germany too and felt the full force of the welcome, which was really pretty impressive. Trains, automobiles, no planes, but probably a kitchen sink in there somewhere, obscured by what was estimated to be a million people at the roadside. Behind the breakaway, it looked as though the main bunch was slowing down to enjoy the sideshow as the gap went up to over four minutes. The weather was more like the south of France than the north of Germany, and the break shrank to just two men when Tor Hushoff began to feel it, dropping back to his team car with an attack of cramp. In the process, he also dropped back behind the main bunch, who decided to cut short the sightseeing and chase. And with 11 kilometres to go, the action was pretty much an all-German affair. Jens Voigt trying to stay away from the bunch to sneak a home win, and Team Telecom leading the chase, determined to set up the same thing for Eric Zabel. Well, Regelsberg is the town we are in now, and yet another massive uh, uh, exhibition of popularity of the passage of the Tour de France as this man gets round the corner, hugs the crowd, Barry, in the hope they won't see him tucked in, in the shadow of the people. Try and keep out of sight, hopefully out of mind, but that field has almost reeled him in now. This has been a superb effort by Jens, a real effort. He sure, I thought at one stage, Paul, he'd broken them, but the steady pacemaking by Telecom, and uh, they're making Lotto help them out in the chase because they have their Spinter McEwen. So why should the Telecom do all of the work? And they've, they've gambled here, haven't they? Because they haven't committed themselves 100%. They've made other teams take part. Well, they don't want to blow themselves up completely. They want to have as many men as possible in the last two kilometres. And the men they really want to have with a kilometre to go is Danilo Hondo in first place and then Gian Matteo Fanini in second place, third place. They would hope to have Eric Zabel. The last kilometre, by the way, is a very interesting last kilometre because at around about 700 metres to go, there is a very sharp left-hand bend. And if you go around that corner in first, second and third position, it will be a very nice setup for Eric Zabel and Team Telecom. But that's not the way it always happens because all of the other sprinters are queuing up onto Zabel's wheel and they want to take advantage of the work that's being done by Team Telecom right now. Well, I'd be very surprised to learn that Eric Zabel had not been to see the run in here to the finish today at some stage during the off season. And uh, he'll know what's coming now. They've got Jens Voigt back in the pack and Freddy Agricole have gone again. Now, this is amazing. One more attack. They've been on the attack all day. And I'm going to stick my neck out here and say this is Sebastian Eno who's just gone away from the field. He's the likely next man that they will use. And the telecom team have now got to go through the whole scenario again. This is a race which will not lie down to the sprinters today. This is going to be a rip-roaring charge into the line. Ludo Dirksens is in the middle there in the Lampre, the, the Belgian national, former Belgian national champion. Axel Merckx was there. There's the world champion as well, Oscar Ferreira. All of the big men are moving to the forward right now. Well, this is a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder battle now, and surely Sebastian Eno cannot survive this with the Lotto riders now riding at full speed. The sprinters have all hooked up and are now in the slipstream of their team riders. This is going to be a very hard last five kilometres. 
just looking, licking his lips there, Paul. That was Serves Canavan, the former champion of uh, Holland. He's looking to possibly lead out Fred for the sprint today. Chaos it is at the front right now. Everybody wants to stay in 15th, 20th place. They don't want to touch their brakes. One thing about riding at this moment in the stage of the Tour de France, if you touch your brakes, you can slide back to 30th or 40th place. And in fact, Eric Zabel in the green jersey just on the right-hand side there seems to be a little bit too far back right now. And he is actually, oh, there's, he's pushing Danilo Hondo forward there. You see that move from the green jersey on Eric Zabel? He wants Hondo to take him a little bit further forward. He's using his teammates sensibly right now. Ferreira is moving across now onto the wheel of the green jersey. This is a question of who breaks first on who breaks last as they go around this nice little chicane for the moment. Still a bit of disorganisation on the front end of the main field as we get one of the telecom riders looking back to see where the rest of the guys are with five kilometres to go. Three miles to the finish. This is going to be a very, very difficult chase into the finish. It's also a tortuous approach to the line in Saarbrucker. It is going to be difficult for the sprinters. This is the dangerous part of the Tour de France, the part that the sprinters relish and lick their lips. But for the rest of the riders, like Lance Armstrong, the riders thinking long-term in the Tour to gain time in the mountains, they really take a back seat and just watch like hawks for riders touching wheels and going down. The Telecom once again in control. They've got all of their men forward. I would expect to see Danilo Hondo ahead of Gian Matteo Fanini. Still Bobby Julik on the front. Julik doing a great job for the team right now. Well, I haven't noticed the capture of the leader, but I am going to presume now that he is uh, he has been caught. As we're watching here under the four-kilometer banner. And the team holding it very much together. They are still saying that there is a gap there on our computer, but I can't believe it at this speed. They've actually put a question mark now on the time spread. So it could well be that uh, off-camera, Eno has been put back into the peloton. The way these boys are riding, I can't believe he can hold them off. I would say no chance at all there. Moving forward, the big map, a train in second position right now, led by Andrea Taffy. They will be looking for Oscar Freire and Tom Steeles. The charge down into town. These corners are very, very tricky and precarious because everybody wants to hold their position. You're leaning right into the corner, getting the knee down as far as possible to lower your centre of gravity and hopefully not lose a gap on the wheel in front of you right now. Lotto are in control. It's a Lotto telecom train at the moment. We are touching speeds, Phil, approaching 35 miles an hour right now. It really is going to be a mad dash. Just look at the speed here of the telecom team now. They've put uh, Eno, its official, back into the pack. We didn't actually see him swept to one side, but he's gone. And telecom have got the head of the race now. But Oscar Freire is using the telecom team to keep a very high position here. He's a member of the Italian Mappe squad. He's a Spaniard, in fact. He is the world champion in his first Tour de France. He was up there in the sprint yesterday, and he might well challenge uh, Eric Zabel because he's a very fast finisher. He's the white jersey down there, but not to be confused, there are three white jerseys. One is the champion of Germany, Danilo Hondo. One is the world champion, Oscar Freire. And the other one is the Australian champion, Robbie McEwen. And the yellow jersey, Paul, knows he needs a result here as well to keep his race lead. New change on the front, Robbie Hunter there for South Africa, obviously going to sacrifice his chances today. Looking over his shoulder, he can see Oscar Freire had moved up into fourth or fifth position. A lot of chaos. Hunter on the front for South Africa. Aldag up there for Germany in third place. Stefan Weissmann in fourth place. There you can see the world champion bumping shoulders with the other man in the white jersey, Danilo Hondo. I have to tell you, Phil, it is absolute chaos at the front end of the main field. Nobody wants to touch their brakes at all right now. And the switch-off coming from Robbie Hunter, looking to see what position position his team leader is in. Well, it's proved one thing, Paul. Hunter, a sprinter in his own right, is riding this race for his world champion teammate, Oscar Freire. Otherwise, he wouldn't be setting the pace at this stage of the race. Big, tall, lanky Ralph Aldag now, the most experienced man on the team, has come through. The yellow jersey, Paul, I don't believe what I'm seeing here, but he's moving up on the right of our picture. Well, he's not going to give up. He's got his man Ludo Dirksen's in front of him right now. He wants to make sure he finishes very close to Eric Zabel, and that would be a huge surprise, beating all kinds of 
predictions. Now we're coming closer and closer to the finishing line. Dirksen's what a big, strong bike rider. They're coming up very close now to a very tricky bend. They're going to sweep round this one, and let's hope everybody stays upright. The yellow jersey is in second position. The world champion is in fourth position. The man who wears the green jersey there, Eric Zabel, is in seventh position. Everybody is battling for the wheels of the sprinters. We are now looking to see when the red kite is going to appear, and I think if my memory serves me correctly, it's just after this bridge. Well, Ludo Dirksen, hats off to the Belgian rider here, who is trying to drag this young man of 23 years of age to his second stage win in as many days, and he's forcing the yellow jersey. He's got no more legs left, and he's put him on the front, which is where he should not be right now, because as they go 1,000 metres from the finish, there is still a left hand to come. Watch to the whereabouts of the green jersey of Zabel. This is a big moment for him now as he turns into the corner on the shoulder of Robbie McEwen, the champion of Australia. There's, I thought there'd been a crash for a moment. They took it wide. There was a crash. Somebody's gone down there, but it's not the two men we expected as lead out is still coming now. The yellow jersey washed away. Watch for the men to break from the centre in green. Oscar Freire is there too as they try for this one. Freddy Rodriguez is about seven men down now. Danilo Hondo is the lead out man. Then it will be Jean Matteo Fanini. Then it will be Zabel with Hunter on his rim. McEwen on his wheel and Freire on his wheel. Now they move over. Now the green comes on the right. Zabel on the right. Freire on the left with McEwen. It's the three of them go for the line. And the world champion has taken it. Oscar Freire with Zabel and McEwen, the runners up. Look at the acceleration there. Robbie Hunter had set this up for the world champion. The world champion coming up the inside there. Robbie McEwen is all over his bike at the moment, but they can do nothing at all to stop this man, Oscar Freire, who, when he is not injured, is the best rider in the world. So, Oscar Freire adds a debut Tour de France stage win to his two world championships, just in case anyone thought they were flukes. And afterwards, he had his rainbow collar felt by Matt Rendell. Oscar tiene una colección formidable de, de, de mallas, ¿no? de jerseys, y ahora 11 segundos le separa de, de la mayo John. Eh, ¿Qué está pensando usted? ¿Con qué va a soñar por la noche? No, por la noche no sé con qué soñaré, ¿eh? pero no sé, yo creo que ahora mi objetivo era también conseguir una etapa y... Y en ningún momento pienso en el mayo amarillo, pero lo que está claro es que si, si puedo conseguirlo no lo voy a desaprovechar. So there's the stage result, Oscar Freire racking up a win on his first tour. Robbie McEwen and Eric Zabel reversing their order from yesterday, second and third behind him. The other big names, including Lance Armstrong and David Miller, finished in the main bunch on the same time as the winner. Now Freire isn't actually supposed to be the fastest man on the MAP-A team, but their top sprinter Tom Steele's had a terrible day. Belgian champion came in 185th, 8.16 behind his teammate. Even further back was Tor Hushov, cramping with every turn of the pedal and finishing a painful 19 minutes 22 down on the day. For the second day, and very much against the odds, Rubens Batoliati stood on the podium in yellow, having ridden intelligently at the front of the bunch all day, you have to say he deserved it. And there are the overall standings. Zabel is closing in and will still be favourite to take the lead again tomorrow, although to do it, he'll have to beat Freire, who's now only 11 seconds off the pace himself in ninth place. Poor old Tor Hushoff, though, is now 189th and last, over half an hour adrift, and desperately in need of a massage. Well, he didn't get the win, but Eric Zabel did at least get the biggest cheer of the day as he retained the green jersey. He might yet take yellow, but not at home. The first stage back in France took the tour into Champagne country. A few vintages too late, sadly, for this beautiful old Citroen, which last saw action in the tour's publicity caravan back in 1929. Anyway, with the time gaps tight and the roads flat, it looked certain that a new race leader would be raising the traditional glass for the cameras by the end of stage three. Well, it wasn't a stage for Lance today, but for the men who reckoned they could sprint themselves into the race lead on the way from Metz to Reims. 174.5 kilometres, with bonuses available at three sprints along the way, as well as the finish, of course. Six kilometres into the race saw the first serious face time of the tour for FTJ.com's Jackie Durand. He rides himself onto the live French coverage every year with suicide breaks, and for this one, he was joined by his fellow Frenchman and close neighbour, 
Frank Renier of the Bonjour team. The second sprint of the day saw the first serious action of it. Eric Zabel took the two-second bonus for third place, heading the bunch behind Renier and Durand, and that meant he was now tied for the race lead with Rubens Batoliati. As the route took the riders past some of the war cemeteries that cover large areas of the landscape of northern France, Credit Agricole's calamitous start to the tour was continuing, with their third rider in trouble in as many days. Today it was Stuart O'Grady who had to drop back to the doctor's car, complaining worryingly of an abnormally high heart rate. Now, on the two road stages we've had so far, Robbie McEwen, the Australian sprinter, has been third and second, which might indicate that the next number in the sequence should be first and a stage win, or it might be a worrying repetition of a pattern of near misses that he suffered before in the Tour, most notably in 1999. Tom Steele is coming again. Zabel on the right. What a finish this is. But Tom Steele is coming. Zabel tell you, Steele gets it on the line. See if it works out better today. <laughs> that is Cipollini who takes it on the line. Today's another day, so I'm just going to forget about yesterday. It's going to be desperately close, but Cipollini has got the win. Bit of a disaster yesterday. Eric Zabel's got the better this time. Yes, he has. Eric Zabel gets it on the line. As far as I'm concerned, it's been a pretty dismal start to the tour. At the end of the first week in 1999, the sprinters' table read Mario Cipollini four stages, Tom Stills two, and Robbie somewhere behind them banging his handlebars in frustration. Perseverance finally got its reward though. Long after Chippo had packed his colour coordinated kit and gone home, Robbie was still going strong on the final stage in Paris. Robbie McEwen is going to get it! Robbie McEwen has done it at last! He's got his stage win in the Tour de France. The little Australian has done it on the very last day. He has won the final stage of the Tour de France. Well, for McEwen, or indeed any of the sprinters to take the stage, the two-man break first had to be reeled in. And the peloton was doing its usual 12 decimal place calculations of the time, distance and speed involved. The peloton is massing just for the moment. There is a chance here. They've shut down, arguing as to who is going to take up the pace. There you can see at the top of the picture the two escapers. They've been ahead since the six kilometre. They are now nine kilometres from the finish. And that's an amazing breakaway. Now, down there, the boys in green are still nursing Stuart O'Grady. And we understand from the team manager, Roger Leger, in fact, uh, he is registering an abnormally high heartbeat. And uh, so this is what his problem is right now. This is a very dangerous moment now for men like Lance Armstrong, men like Tyler Hamilton and Levi Leipheim and the men who are hoping to ride high in the overall standings because the run into town like this is always very dangerous. And that's probably why US Postal Service, Phil, have come to the front right now. There was starting to be a serious amount of disorganization on the front end of the main pack. Everyone was bunching around. There is a big, strong crosswind as well. And Armstrong, I think, playing a defensive role here, sending his guys up towards the front end of the main pack. The big revelation this year for US Postal Service on the front there, wearing number six, Floyd Landis. And uh, I was just reading in the newspapers this morning that his mother actually yesterday, or at the weekend, watched the television for the first time in her life. She actually wanted to see her son racing in the Tour de France and went at the, at the age of 50 years old to go and watch the TV. Oh, I was going to say she's as old as me, Paul, but I won't mention that. Anyway, George Hincapie is the other rider, number four there, the other strong man on the US Postal Services team. It's always nice to claim an extra view, and I must say, as we now see the two leaders here, they had a little smile, though, we missed it. And, in fact, the flick of the right arm from Frank Renier is just, uh, you know, saying, well, come on through, it's your turn, as we've been doing for the last four hours of cycling. He says, forget it, the race is back with us. Well, it's, uh, it's sad, really, because they were so close. About seven kilometres to go, they've been picked up here. As we now see, Lotto again taking control at the top. This is Rick Verbrugger, the leader and uh, formerly stage winner of the opening prologue of the Tour of Italy. Good time trialist rider here, he comes through, brings the race through. There's Frank Renier still with some legs to hopefully elbow his way back into the field and finish with them. In about fifth position there, wearing number one, was Lance Armstronger. A quick tap on the back from the team teammates of Renier, he's back in the fold. It's a bit disorganised right now, no team has come to the front. You see Team Telecom have done a lot of work out on the open road to pull back those two breakaways. They've done it right now, but they haven't got the firepower left to take up the pace, making up the front. I would expect to see very shortly Danilo Hondo coming forward, then Gian Matteo Fanini as well, because they will probably wait till the last two or three kilometres to try and do that. 
The sprinters in there for France as well from the Bronzor team are Damien Nazon and Emmanuel Magna. Armstrong himself, Phil, is still in the top 10 or 12 places there, rubbing shoulders with the sprinters. He wants to keep to the front, keep himself out of danger if he can. Now, another left-hand bend. Everybody seems to be around there nice and safely. Christophe Agnoluto was on the front for AG2R. They've got a good sprinter in their midst as well, the Estonian national champion, Jan Kersipu, moving forward as well. Well, Damien Nazon, by the way, at four kilometres to go, was the rider who crashed into the finishing straight. And Anjoluto is trying to go clear here, the Toro Swiss winner. Not this year, but a couple of years ago. But Nazon, by the way, has got no skin right down the left side of his leg, all the way from his thigh to his ankle from that crash. And he's still in there looking for the win again. Now we're sweeping across this beautiful city of France. Uh, it'll shortly narrow down before we line up for the actual finish uh, just down the side of the main Metz to Paris motorway. I'll tell you what, Eric Zabel's a long way further back right now. And Robbie McEwen's up into third place. Right on his wheel is Fabio Baldato. There is Michael Sandstod. He's looking over his shoulder to see just exactly what the position is of Laurent Jalabert. The, the Estonian national champion is in there, Jan Kersipu in the dark blue jersey there, but looks to me as if Eric Zabel is an awful long way down right now. Tom Steeles is pretty well much up in the top ten too. Well, Steele's a character who's been off the back every day, and he is there. He's the rider with the yellow crash helmet down there. As Zabel begins to move up very rapidly to reposition now. He hasn't got control of the peloton as he had the other day because this is the Lotto riders now who are trying to steer the Australian McEwen to the stage victory. McEwen, for my money, has tremendous legs, but the world champion, Oscar Freire, is sitting on the wheel of his teammate, the Hungarian time trial champion, Bedrogi. This is going to be... A real sprint for the line. Robbie Hunter's in there too. He's going to try and do it. This is a last-minute attack. That's probably going to be a man like Nico Matin from Coffee Disc. A good move by him, trying to surprise all of the sprinters coming off the front, hitting them just at the right time. It is Nico Matin, but he hasn't surprised anybody at all today. He's just going off the front of the main pack, but they're just reassembling behind him. That will cause a bit of consternation for Team Lotto. It's caused a bit of disorganisation. Squeezing through the gap there in the green jersey is Eric Zabel. They're all over. Over the road right now trying to organize themselves there are no teammates at all of Eric Zabel he's having to count on the other sprinters right now Hunter is there in fourth position there is the world champion Oscar Freire there's a big line on the right hand side now this is coming from Alessio well Alessio have a great sprinter too and it's even off and he's about three men back and I must say that there's no team got control of this race today they are all out of control because Telecom tried and couldn't. Lotto have got a little bit confused, but watch out for Robbie McEwen. He's got the third place position there, and that is the best right now. Up into second, though, the national champion of Germany, Danilo Hondo. He won't be too happy having Robbie McEwen, the Australian champion, on his wheel, but there in fourth now is the man, Eric Zabel. There comes the line of Francais de Gere. They will be looking after Baden Cook, the young Aussie rider. There is the world champion moving up into fifth position, sixth position on the wheel of Eric Zabel. It's going to be a massive charge to the line they're coming up to that corner any moment Whoa, now oh look at Kersey Pugh leaning on McEwen there when they come out of this tunnel now they're going to take that corner it's Hondo in control at the front but watch out for the last minute attacks here comes the swing and it's Hondo taking them through break hard and it's very narrow they'll sight it now They've made it safely because it was dry, and now they've got a chance to go for the goal. The big sprinters are there. Zabel will have to take on Oscar Freire. He'll have to take on the McEwen as group again because they're all there now. And again, Robbie Hunter trying to lead out the world champion teammate, but he's got on the back wheel there instead. Fabio Baldato is there. Uh, Baden Cook is in the centre, the little squad rider in white. As Credit Agricole tried to bring through Tor Hoshoff here. This is going to be a most amazing finish because Still, the green jersey of Zabel is deep in the peloton. And in that peloton, too, is Braden Cook. Now Zabel making his move as Hushoff is trying to win. This is the man who finished last yesterday, finished 20 minutes behind. He's keeping the sprint going here for the line. And on his wheel is still Hunter, as I think Zabel is boxed in. But now McEwen comes. McEwen is going to lead out to Eric Zabel for the line. Robbie McEwen, I don't think, is going to lose this one. He's moving off his line. There'll be a protest, but McEwen, for the moment, gets the win. Well, McEwen gets the win there, and I think the judges will look very closely at the photo finish there because he came across the road using almost half of it. Now, just look at this move here by Robbie McEwen. He sends at this point as Zabel clicks. He looks over, you see. He sees Zabel, and he has almost run out of energy here. 
Now there's only one tactic left, and that's to change direction and stop the man coming through. Now if the judges see it that way, they will relegate him from first to last on the stage. And I would think that's about 189th. I waited and waited, took my chance, and this time I got across to the barriers. And uh, I saw Zabel coming, but uh, with a tailwind slide uphill, I thought I could hold it. And Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Well, there were questions asked about whether Robbie cut across Eric Zabel in the final sprint, but there was no protest from Team Telecom, so he was safe to celebrate with his wife Angelique and Ewan McEwen, the rhyming baby, making his tour debut at the age of less than two months. If his dad keeps going, he might make it onto the podium like Eric Zabel's son does every year. So there's the stage result. McEwen, Zabel and another Aussie, Baden Cook, in his first ever tour, taking an impressive third place. David Miller rolled in safely with the bunch. Unlike Jackie Durand, who paid for all that effort and all that airtime, coming in over a minute down. But the most baffling placing was Stuart O'Grady's, looking like a man about to abandon for most of the stage, and finishing 10th. There had to be an explanation, but still we provided it. Yeah, it was, well, it's called tachycardia. Um, just a, a little problem when uh, it comes out of nowhere and the heart just kind of uh, skips a beat and then just goes uh, very fast. I was sitting on about 230, 220 to 235 heart rate for nearly an hour, so didn't have much energy. I know since 10 kilometres ago it was back to normal, so uh, obviously sitting at 230 for an hour, the heart was a little bit tired, but um, yeah, it's okay now. Will there be some more checks in the, tonight, tomorrow morning? And... No, I mean, you know, it's happened in the past and I've been able to ride right after, um, so, you know, hopefully it doesn't come back. And here's how the stage left the race overall. The stage placings are reversed at the top with Zabel eight seconds ahead of Robbie McEwen. David Miller still going nicely in eighth. Stage four of the tour was team time trial day, a group stage with huge potential impact on the individual standings. Eric Zabel led the race coming into the day, and here's what he thought of the likelihood that his team might keep him there. Mm, not so high, <laughs> <laughs> because we, we see the circuit, uh, we train uh, on this road, and it's hard, and the wind stays like this. It's a lot of headwind, so it, it comes uh, much more harder then. And don't forget uh, the, our best free time trialist stay at home. <laughs> so I think uh, the chance for you to post with Lance Armstrong is a little bit higher. Now, that might have sounded a bit pessimistic, but in fact, Eric Zabel was just being realistic. An individual time trial is just you against the clock and the fastest man wins. A team time trial is you and your mates against the clock and the fifth fastest man dictates who wins. And the US Postal team now ready to take their team time trial formation for this special stage of the Tour de France. Now it is a little bit complicated and here's Paul to tell us more about it. Well Phil, all the teams basically will adopt the same kind of tactic on today's stage and it's all very much dependent on the wind direction. Just take a quick look at these diagrams here, imagine that the red arrows are the wind direction. If all nine riders were to get across the line together, they'd basically be banging their heads against a brick wall. So what they will do, they'll adopt a long formation like this. The guys who are sitting in 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th position, etc. will be saving up to 30% of their energy. The main tactic is for the front man to push the pace up to 50-55 km an hour. Once he's done his turn, he'll slip to the back of the group, thus recuperating before he goes forward again. The other tactic which we will probably see on the roads today will be when the wind is at a diagonal direction. Here the riders will form a long echelon across the road here because still the same situation applies. The second, third, fourth and fifth men are able to ride out of the wind, save themselves just a little bit. But the most important thing about the team time trial is it's not Lance Armstrong's strength on his own, it's the strength of the whole team. He needs all nine riders to stay there for as long as possible and the time is taken on the fifth man to cross the finishing line.
Well, the route today was 67 and a half kilometres from Epinay to Chateau Thierry, heading mainly due west, which would mean strong headwinds, and punctuated by a testing climb at the halfway point. Eric Zabel and the telecom team were among the early starters, but weren't even fast enough to post the best time of the first seven teams to go. The team that was best of the early finishers was Fasa Bortolo. They came in one hour, 21 minutes and 19 seconds for the course. The start times were in reverse order of the rankings in the team competition so far, and this is how the last five lined up. We pick it up now with the big five all out on the road. CSC Tiscali have gone through the first checkpoint with the best time, but fastest through the second, despite losing a rider to a puncture, are on say. Let's join Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. 20 kilometres to go and the clouds starting to build up on the horizon here for the Once squad. Down to eight men leaving Mikel Pradera at the side of the road with a rear flat tyre. Team deciding not to wait for him and they're still keeping themselves in this very organised line. It's such a technical discipline, the discipline of team time trialling. You have to make decisions very quickly on the road and orchestrate just exactly which tactic you want to adopt. If it be the big long line with one man setting the pace for 100, 150 metres, or the two lines as we see here from US Postal Service. Right now, they're doing much shorter turns on this descent. We saw a few moments ago they were touching 45 miles an hour. And still Armstrong there, second from the back there, wearing number one, is allowing his teammates to do plenty of turns at the front. He's a sensible rider, Armstrong, here, because he doesn't want to destroy his men. He knows that to keep them together for as long as possible gives him the advantage in the last quarter of the course. There's Lance Armstrong, and now this is crucial for them. They are looking to be just a few seconds off the leaderboard, or if they've swung it round, no, they stay just a few seconds off the leaderboard here. 49.55, plays at 50 and still counting, so they're losing ground to Onse here. 49.55 to 50.08 for US Postal. That's 13 seconds they're losing right now to the Onse squad. Which so they've actually gained a second. A slight advantage. Look at Armstrong there in that very special skin suit that he's had prepared for the big occasions. His face still calm and collected. And the impressive thing about Armstrong so far is he's not gone to the front and tried to show off the power that we all know that he has. He's using all of his teammates, and the fact that they still have these nine riders may well tip the advantage towards them in the last 27 kilometres of this race. They've pulled back one second over that section of the course there to the Onse squad, and in around about 10 minutes' time, I think the more important result we will get will be the position of Team CSC Tiscali, who led US Postal at the first time check by 20. And it looks here as we go back to cover is uh, Daniel Atienza, the Spanish rider, is having a little bit of trouble, hanging on to the tail. This is the climb which hurts the peloton and the riders on the team here. Well, David Atienza trying to hang on to the to the uh, tail of the Cofidis team, and we're waiting to see what CSC to Scarly because they're just arriving in Le Bruy. We haven't got to the time for them, but it's coming over on our race radio and they've got the best time i'm just looking over paul's shoulder here to find out what it is 49 49 there it is for you to see as well so 49 minutes 49 seconds they have gone best team only two teams have got inside 50 minutes on say 49 55 a six second battle there and us postal are closing in as well well, there's the television camera right on this team, which looks so good. It turns the team time trial into poetry in motion. The echelon perfectly formed. They move smoothly across and slip up into the slipstream. Then they race through. One rider not working now, Paul Heras. Heras having a hard time. Let's not forget Roberto Heras is not a great time trialist. He's a fantastic mountain climber. Francisco Cabello coming off the back here. Done his job for Team Kelme today. He's pushed himself to the limit for as long as he possibly can. And all he will do now is try and make sure he gets to the finish line inside the elimination time. The referee getting a little bit nervous there, trying to get by. But from this man, there's no question that he's cheating or doing anything illicit at all. But he has just been caught by the Lamprey Dakin rider there, who was obviously dropped from his team a little while earlier. 
Now then, let's have a look at this. This should be a very interesting time coming in because it is almost certainly going to wipe Faso Bortolo away completely. By about a minute and 45 seconds, I would think, if they've continued their progress, well, they've had their share of bad luck too. They've lost a man very early on today with a flat tyre. It happened at 24 kilometres in, so they've ridden over 40 kilometres without a one-man on the team, uh, Pradera. But this time is going to be a sensational one and will be the time to beat, I think, for sure. Onsei have lived up to the reputation as a great team time trial outfit. Look at that time now. 1.21 was the best time. They're going to be inside at 1.20 for the ride. Big sprint to the line required. They have to put the stopwatch on the fifth man over the line. But they've held it together very well despite the early problem. They bring eight men home, best time, 1.19.49 for Onse. Situation at the finish, Onse are in with the marvellous time of 1 hour 19.49. Passa Bortolo a minute 30 slower in second place. Ibanesto.com a minute 56 back in third. Domo Farm feet a very good ride by Domo at 2.12 and Rabobank at 2.16. But now we're looking at the Kelme riders here. They are still holding on to fifth place with seven kilometers to go, but the Cofferty's team is yet to arrive there, and so too is CSC. And they look as though they're beginning to... Uh, the strong men are taking command of this team, and they're rather wrecking it. There's Oscar Sevilla. Well, the big thing is that Sevilla at the moment is losing himself around about two minutes on Lance Armstrong on the road. Now, the individual times of the riders are added to their overall classification at the end of the day and that is an important loss for a man like Oscar Sevilla and of course Santiago Botero. Yeah. It's a great collective effort by Kelme but they are losing serious time. This team we're looking at now, Tyler Hamilton's team and the team of Laurent Jalabert have taken the risk of leaving one of their strong men behind Michael Sandstod. He's just had a flat tyre. They have to keep the pressure on as much as possible because Laurent Jalabert's dream at the moment is getting himself into the yellow jersey he started his day at the same time as Lance Armstrong in the overall standings. They had a nine seconds advantage over the best place of the Once riders, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. So as long as they can finish in front of Once and US Postal Service, Laurence Jalabert will be in yellow tonight. And that will be the fulfillment of a dream for him. Uh, Kelme Costa Blanca then coming in. Currently they should confirm that third place. No, they've slipped down to fourth now. They've looked very ragged these last 15 kilometers or so. They've given 110% to try and keep the two leaders in the action. And they're going to come round just on an hour and 22 minutes as they race up towards the line. It's going to go even a little bit slower than that as the clock is not stopping quick enough for Kelme. They're now only going to be in sixth with two or three teams still to beat them. 1.22.08. There are three teams left to finish. Situation on Serium at the best time, miles ahead of the rest of the finishers today. A minute and a half up on Fasa Bortolo. Just three teams less to come. Update on the weather forecast. Dry on the finishing line again. But as you can see, uh, thunder is threatening. But only three teams left out there now. And this is CSC Tiscali. Well, just look at all of the riders in this magnificent US postal team. They are all still together. And uh, I think Lance has put the blocks on a little bit to say, let's just steady it down. We don't have to win this race. Well, it's, it's not important for him to win this race. The important thing is to stay in a reasonable amount of contact with CSC Tiscali and, of course, with the Onse squad. Because if one of these other teams were to take the yellow jersey, he knows over the next few flat stages they are going to do everything to control it. If, for example, Laurent Jalabert gets the yellow jersey tonight, he will fight tooth and nail to keep himself in yellow for as long as absolutely possible. But here they are, the blue train. Here they are indeed, second best time, at seven kilometres before the finish. Now, I don't think they can bridge the 38 seconds. They were behind Onse at that point. Uh, but if they come over the line here in second, they finished fourth in this race last year, by the way. And uh, a similar time position today is, is the worst they can expect. Second or third, I think, is the best. But they're going to push themselves right to the limit. You can see riders dropping off now, job done. They only need five to cross the line for the time. Ekimov has peeled off on the far right there now. The most important 
something is of course that Lance Armstrong finishes with those five riders. Floyd Landis also here and looking good. As they drive up to the line, they've just popped down into second place, but they'll be coming across the line quite clearly in second place, putting Faster Bortolo down into third with two teams still to finish. The arrival of US Postal, they'll be well satisfied with this day. One at 2005. They pulled a lot back over the last 10 kilometers there. In fact, only losing just over 15 seconds to Onsay at the end of the day. So they pulled themselves back a good 20 seconds over the last seven kilometers of racing. And I'd say a lot of that went down to George Hinkapi, Lance Armstrong, and Yatislav Ekimov. The important thing, though, is not losing today's stage, but keeping the team together as a collective. They will have high morale tonight. They will be happy with this performance. We now look again at a CSC to Scarly. And I'm just wondering if, in fact, Sansa has come back here, Paul. We'll keep an eye out for him because uh, it looks like they might have eight riders still in this group now. CSC head up towards the Czech. Tyler Hamilton was definitely in there. Hamilton, by the way, wears number 52 in the Tour de France this year. His uh, team leadership was given to Laurent Jalabert. Now look at that. They've actually lost time going through there. They've dropped down to third place at the 60-kilometer point, 53 seconds behind. Amazing the turnaround in the books. But as we've been saying, as I've been stressing since the start of this team time trial, Phil, it is so important to keep as many men together as possible. Losing those two men has lost the time trial today and the yellow jersey for Laurent Jalabert. And Kofidis now with David Miller on board. They've lived up to the name, they put in a much better performance than they did one year ago in the Tour de France, even so. They're currently in fifth place, uh, that'll be when CSC come home. So if they're going to hold on to fifth, they must be at least coming in now with the fourth best time. As again, they're standing their men one off the back as they keep the top five together. Andrei Kivalev and David Miller, the powerhouses here, still in there as they race up towards the line. Fifth at the check at 60 kilometres. And to hold it, they must cross the line now with the fourth best time. It's been a fairly solid ride by Cofidis. They had a good middle sector to the course, lost it a little bit over these last 10 kilometers or so. But it might be they get a good sprint out of it. Fourth, they must cross the line in fourth if they want to hold on to fifth by the end of the day. Big sprint required for now. The fifth time, fifth the rider is where the clock will stop, and they'll get it. So they will make the final fifth. 1-21-33 for Miller's Cofferty's team. Situation with one team to finish. Onse, our best team. US Postal second, uh, Fasa Bortolo third. That's good news for riders like Ivan Basso in the Fasa Bortolo team as well. And this team of Laurent Jalabert, he doesn't have always have bad days in the Tour. He can remember many good days in the Tour de France. And he knows the uh, fortunes of a professional cyclist Despite all of the progress we have made with the lightest equipment in the world, we can't yet cure the cause of the common puncture. Well, there's some things that you uh, always have to throw in to keep the sport of cycling interesting, and that certainly has changed the books completely today for Laurent Jalabert. The Onsay's time of 1.19.49 has ticked by on the unofficial clock on the finishing line here, as we can look a little bit further down the road from our commentary position, and I think they've also gone outside the time of US Postal Service as well. Well, well Paul's eyesight is absolutely amazing. I'm still looking for the clock, but never mind as we're looking here at CSC, racing up towards the finish. And I think you're right, I think the time has gone by. Oh, Laurent Jalabert, the jaw set there as they drag this team in now as they head up towards the finish. There's still a lot of speed in this team. They put up a tremendous fight. There's two poor old Kelme riders tailed off by their team today. They are just finishing. They will get a, a pretty bad time to their individual classification. It's almost certainly third place, and if they can't match the time of Kofidis, but they'll do that. Uh, so it looks like a third place finish for CSC. Bad luck uh, taking them perhaps off the leaderboard, or was it the consistency of the other two who persisted and beat them? Third, 1 20 35, and so the new Mayo Jean of the Tour de France will be Igor Gonzalez de Galliano in only his second Tour de France. And here's the result that put him there. The favourites, US Postal, beaten into second place by 16 seconds. CSC Tiscali third. And an excellent ride by David Miller's Cofferty's team to take fifth. Uh, uh, Solidaire. We were really good. We worked really well together. It was a 
we've never been so motivated for a team time trial. And uh, we ride really well, we ride really as a team. And uh, yeah, it was good. It was, I wouldn't go as far as saying it was fun, but we, uh, I think I'm really happy with it. I think our team shows how well our team's progressing, you know? It's a, it's a full unit now. Talking of full units, they might have lost Mikel Pradera to a puncture, but all nine on say riders were back together again on the podium, celebrating a result which has seen them colonize the leading places. Six of the top eight are on say riders, and one of the top one, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. Onsay had confirmed Lance Armstrong's pre-race prediction that they'd be one of the strongest teams by being stronger than his in the team time trial. The question now is can they use their strength in depth to launch a full-scale challenge on the defending champion? Well, today's route didn't look like much of a threat to Onsay's plans. 195 flat kilometres from Soissons to Rouen. Perfect for the sprinters, or the kind of breakaway that often develops the day after a big stage like the team time trial when everyone's tired. The unwelcome distinction of first rider to abandon the tour went to Tom Steeles, the MAPE sprinter who's perhaps still suffering the after effects of glandular fever. And after an early crash, Richard Vergonc was in a bit of discomfort too, getting running repairs from the race doctor. After a couple of unsuccessful attempts, a five-man breakaway did form, and in it were Belgium's Ludo Dirksens and the Estonian sprinter Jan Kersipu. They were joined by Italy's Stefano Casagranda, Christophe Edelin of France and Michael Sandstott, the Danish CSC rider, whose puncture cost them the team time trial. The pressure is now certainly coming on at the front end of the main field, Phil. These, these efforts on the front now are becoming much longer, much harder, picking up the pace making to over 50 kilometres an hour. But uh, there's another crash being announced now as well. There's a crash, we'll pick the pictures up as soon as we can. So this is all happening at 19 kilometres to go now. The gap has just come through at 2 minutes and 23 seconds. McGee has a flat tyre, and as Paula said, a tough one. There's been a terrific crash in the back here. The cameras are now organising. Quite a few riders are stunned down there. A lot of the Uscatel riders, one of the Lamprey riders on the far right of the road. It uh, doesn't look uh, terribly good at all, but this is a tremendous crash at high speed and uh, we don't know how it happened, our camera's switching to the back of the race. Well, this indicating a lot of riders were under serious pressure. There's the national champion, Nicolas Vaugondi, he's there. There's a Lamprey rider who is down and not looking very good at all. He looks in serious difficulty and that, in fact, is Marco Pinotti. Bocharov is in there as well, the AG2R leader. He is also involved in that crash. But I have to say, Marco Pinotti is not looking very good. Gerard Porte, the doctor, is right there alongside him in the white shirt. But this shows that the riders of the Tour de France at the moment are under serious pressure. When a group goes down like that, it shows that there is a lot of fatigue creeping in. Well, that's very, very sad indeed at 19 kilometers to go. Uh, Pinotti here certainly looks uh, pretty stunned at... Uh, Gerard Porte is absolutely on hand and as Panotti is going to be left on the roadside here the two Uscadel riders have moved on minute 45 the gap and we're looking at just six miles from the finish and they have just that little gap in favor and once they get into Rouen they'll come off a plateau and race down to the banks of the River Seine and it could be there where they will survive to the finish now there was a mass of riders caught or delayed in that crash at the back we believe also that Telecom had Kevin Livingstone down there he is also in a group behind at the minute and one or two of the important team leaders were delayed as well but they've now uh, settled into consolidated chase and we're talking by the way at a 38 mile an hour chase just now because we've seen the speedometers on the motorbikes they are absolutely flying on the approach to Rouen and the peloton is uh, splitting under the pressure well, we're looking now at the leading group of five as they go under the banner with 10 kilometers to go and in a few moments time phil they will i think it's about two kilometers from here when they start the descent down into the outskirts of rouen and certainly on that 50 mile an hour descent they're not going to lose very much time at all and it's still hovering at the one minute and 45 seconds advantage for the five leaders and despite this desperate chase by jens voigt here on the front they're not now making any headway at all into the leading group's advantage. 
It's not coming down quick enough. They've been knocking off uh, around about five or ten seconds for every kilometre so far. So, in theory, these men should still have a 45-second advantage when they come down to the last kilometre. But it depends on whether or not we start to see men acting as passengers. Ludo Dirksen here has taken up the rear position at the moment, and that will start to worry the backs of the minds of these riders as they realize they're getting passengers they're getting men who are trying to save a little bit for the sprint right now Jan Kersipu will be looking over his shoulder to see who he thinks may well try and launch the surprise attack because certainly somebody will try and jump clear from this five-man group on the run in towards the finish because if they take it to the line with Kersipu I would expect him to blow everybody away the gap still coming down a minute and 18 seconds right now the main field is stretched out into one big long line and the difference between the first man and the last man in this peloton right now will be around about 45 seconds they haven't given up the ghost they are still going to chase now you can see now Eric Zabel has sent one or two riders to the front in front of Zabel there Zabel is wearing the green jersey he's got Danilo Hondo right in front of him a minute 13 seconds right now it's going to be very dramatic this last few kilometers they've got a chance because of this said that's virtually where we tip off now just ahead and now they're going to fly through the city here because you can see in the distance Ruan lying here more or less in the valley and they've really got no time to discuss how they're going to get out of this one and beat each other because the whole pack is riding high behind as they go under five kilometers to go Many of the riders behind in the crash have not rejoined, including one of the big men on the Uskadel team, David Echebarria, and the man who won in the Pyrenees last year, Roberto Leseca. They were both down in the crash, and they're both still behind the peloton. Quick glimpse there, you could see that uh, Jan Kersipu, the Estonian champion, taking himself into fifth position on the road. The reason he's doing this right now is he wants to keep a very close eye on the four other riders in this breakaway. Stefano Casagrande a few moments ago just tightening the Velcro straps on his shoes there to keep his feet as firmly in the pedals as possible. This is the descent right now. When they come off the bottom of this descent, they've got about four kilometers to go to the finishing line. This is the tactical moment. They really need to keep working at the front right now because the main field are going to charge down this descent at around about 55 miles an hour. Yes, this is a horrendous descent here. They are now under the five kilometers to go, so they too are beginning the descent into the city of Rouen. There, the gendarme working overtime to warn the riders about those nasty little bits of furniture in the center of the road. But this, uh, I think, can only be the saving grace of the breakaway. It's much easier to descend at speed in a small group than a big peloton. They're all working, and this is now the counter-attacking. Uh, is going to come from the five in the front and they're not going to work together now it could be fatal to do that they need to keep the rhythm on if they start shadow boxing they're finished for the day sandstad i think will go soon he cannot afford a sprint finish he can't sprint and watch out for the man at the back casa grande i think if anybody's going to beat kersey poo today it is the italian on the back of this line well, they should survive. It's 45 seconds at three kilometers to go. Stefano Casagrande has decided now his tactic is going to be wait until the very last moment. But it's going to be all in the finishing straight at the same time. Dirksen is getting nervous there. Here you can see on the front Danilo Hondo, the man who wants to lead out Eric Zabel. There's no big chase right now. Everybody's getting nervous. Robbie McEwen is in there, the Australian national champion. They are all over the road, but nobody is chasing. The five men will almost certainly survive. But here comes Christophe Manjon now, clashing shoulders there, and Hondo took a good look to see who just hit him on the shoulder. Well, it was the leader of the King of the Mountains. Now we're heading down to the turn onto the River Seine, and this is the move now. There's still a long way to go here, long straight, and uh, they've now, there's the long straight. If you're on the front, it is not the place to be. And it looks as though here, the youngster on the ride here, uh, Christophe Edelen, is really out of power. Now, marking every move, they've got the man who is the sprinter at the head of the race. That's where they can keep an eye on him. Ahead is the one kilometre to go. All five are together, and if we could swing the camera around, and now Casagrande has made his move. He's moved again. They're forcing Kersibu to chase all of these little counter-attacks. He's putting a lot of pressure now. The move coming from Sandstod. He just got himself back on. Kersibu again has to dig deep again. He has to nail down these attacks. 
one at a time. They know he's the fastest man in the group, but watch out, the best time to attack right now would be for Ludo Dirksens to go straight over the top. They're inside the final kilometer. They've 30 seconds advantage over the main field. They will survive today, but watch out for the move coming by the young Frenchman. Because that's the time to go when they sat up. He had to make the running. He's the lead out man now, and Kersi Poo has locked on the big sprinter. A chance to return to the top in a Tour de France for him and claim a third stage win. Casagrande bits his teeth, but Kersi Poo saw him come. Kersi Poo straight into his slipstream here now. Dirksen has been dodging wheels and still holding on to third place. Now, Casagrande has made the mistake. Kersi Poo won't come yet. He try and will wait until the last possible moment. But they've done a good one. They've got him back in the lead. Sorry about the tunnel, but we're back in view now. Casagrande on the middle of our picture. And now Sandstorm grits his teeth again to try and make amends for yesterday. He goes for the line, but Kersi Poo is in the perfect position. Dirksen is going to take him on. Dirksen is going to go for Jan Kersi Poo. Now there's not many of them will get over Kersi Poo. Kersi Poo is now clear and is going to get the win, but only just he gets it on the line from Sandstot, Dirksen, Casagrande, Edelain. Now the bunch are coming in, and this is still a very important sprint between Robbie McEwen and the rider in the green jersey there of Eric Zabel. Still trying to get online with him. Robbie Hunter, the South African rider, right in the centre of our picture, as now Matteo Pignini takes up the lead out for Eric Zabel. Zabel goes, taking McEwen with him. Now, can Robbie get over the top of him and take the sprint? I think he might, because McEwen, shoulder to shoulder, has got the advantage again. McEwen has closed the gap on that green jersey. Close it by quite a few places there as well. You may well find that he got himself enough points to get himself the green jersey. Well, the main field got it wrong today, but only by around about 30 seconds. That's all it needs to get victory in the Tour de France. Jan Kersipu today getting what is for him his third ever stage win in a Tour de France and everyone is always as sweet as the last one as Sam said it was who led him out for the victory not intentionally well it was close but for the first time this tour a breakaway stayed away with Jan Kersipu winning a low speed chase at the line from his fellow SKPs first man to congratulate him was another regular breakaway merchant Jens Voigt who seemed genuinely happy to see someone had finally done it and there's confirmation of the result. The five-man break filling the top five places with the peloton just 33 seconds out on their calculations. The bunch print behind the breakaway went to Robbie McEwen with Baden Cook edging out Eric Zabel today and all the big names finishing in the pack. Definitively not in the pack was Rick Verbrugger caught in the same crash that brought Marco Pinotti down at 16 kilometers to go. He came in last 13 minutes 19 behind the field. So, Jan Kersabu gets a win on one of the last few days available for the sprinters, even though he got it via a breakaway. From the look on your face as you came across the line, you had given that everything. Yeah, I had everything and even a little bit more. I was really... I had nothing left. When did you realise that it was just going to be between you five? Well, I, I thought... I started to thought that it was since 25 kilometres to go. Then I, uh, I saw that it's, uh, we're going to make it. And this is what Kersipu's win does to the overall standings. Absolutely nothing. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano leads four seconds ahead of his teammate Josiba Belocchi, with Lance Armstrong another three seconds back. David Miller stays 23rd, with the time gaps unchanged all the way down the line. consecutive flat stages leading up to the individual time trial on stage nine nothing dramatic was likely to change in the race for the yellow jersey for the points competition though they could be crucial days through the middle comes Eric Zabel with a green jersey on the line that's it Eric is in green Robbie McEwen I don't think is going to lose this one he's moving off his line there'll be a protest but McEwen for the moment gets the win now Stuart O'Grady is going to try, O'Grady is going to edge it, oh and it was so close on the line but he thinks he got it. Now the green comes on the right, Zabel on the right, Freire on the left and McEwen, it's the three of them go for the line and the world champion has taken it, Oscar Freire with Zabel and McEwen the runners up.
The green jersey is the competition for the tour's hourly paid workers, not just sprinters but hard men who come out every day to earn their points. And there are two ways to get them. At the finish, points are awarded on a sliding scale to the first 25 riders across the line. That's why we saw Eric Zabel and Robbie McEwen fighting for sixth place yesterday. It was worth 20 points. There are also points available out on the road at Hotspot Sprints. Six for the first man under the banner, four for the second and two for the third. So while the yellow jersey holder can sit quietly in the bunch on flat stages and just keep an eye on his rivals, green jersey contenders have to be out there working every stage. The hardest working man in bike business the last six years has been Eric Zabel who's won a record half a dozen green jerseys in a row. Last year he held up a strong challenge from Stuart O'Grady. This year Robbie McEwen is trying to bring the run to an end and he's out sprinted Zabel at the finish on the last three stages. It's uh, very close between uh, Robbie and me and also the other Australian riders uh, like uh, Cook and uh, O'Grady are still still in shape and uh, we see what's happened the next days. So currently the points competition looks like this. Zabel's lead is down to just two points after Robbie McEwen out sprinted him yesterday. The impressive Baden Cook in his first tour is lying third and yesterday's stage win has Jan Kursipu ahead of Stuart O'Grady for the moment. And the reason the next three days are so important is because after the time trial on stage nine, the tour heads south to the mountains. And there, the sprinters won't be earning any points. They'll be hanging on at the back. Now, one final thing about the green jersey competition, and it's this thing. Now, it doesn't look very dangerous. I mean, you'd struggle to hijack a plane with it. But according to the tour organization, this is an offensive weapon. The problem is that PMU, who sponsor the green jersey, distribute hundreds of these things every day, presumably so that fans can give the riders a big hand at the finish. Cue laughter from the studio audience. However, Robbie McEwen wasn't laughing the other day as the fans hung over the barrier and Rance waving these things in his path during the final sprint. I got hit with a couple of those in the arm, got hit in the head by one, um, got a bit of skin off my arm, but um, yeah, well, scars, I mean, it's not too bad. I feel like a little school kid going, look, mum, I hurt myself. But, uh, I'm impressed. But, you know, it's like, I'm doing 60-something K an hour and, and people are hitting, I've got another one on my shoulder and lucky I had a helmet on, otherwise I could have a big big one across my head. But, uh, you know, I had to get away from the barriers then because I was, I was scared that someone was going to hit me in the face with a hand and I'd, I'd lose it that way rather than someone riding past me yeah, you know, and pure speed. Well, there's the stage six route, just on 200 kilometres to Alençon, and there were a possible 53 green jersey points available, six apiece for winning the three hotspot sprints, and 35 for winning the stage. Well, Robbie McEwen took the first six, out sprinting Zabel, who only picked up two points for third behind Jan Sverada, and that four-point swing meant McEwen was now the leader on the road in the green jersey competition by two points. A little before the first sprint had been the first crash of the day. David Miller was caught up in it and suffered cuts to his arms and legs, but he got back on and rejoined the main bunch. 15 seconds. And I think that's causing Jackie Durant to think about it now. There they are. The riders know it. They've looked over that. And there we are. Jackie was waiting. A last a desperate attempt now by this lone warrior, Jackie Durant. Look at the speed now. He rested enough. It's all or nothing now as he faces up to the last 12 kilometres to the line. What a lap. Break has surrendered, Paul. He's going alone. He's amazing. He really is. He will never put the sword down at all. He wants to get out there and have a go up until the last possible minute. He really is just extending his agony at the front end of the main field. You can see the rest of the group have been swept up right now. Durant is possibly hoping that in the confusion of the rest of the main group being caught, he might just survive off the front but you don't catch out experienced men like Andrea Taffy. Taffy's just on the front of the peloton at the moment, and he knows that this is the sort of move that Jackie Durand will try and pull. Well, he's a very popular bike rider, is Jackie Durand, especially in this area, not far from his home in Laval, and he's on his own, and he's going to have to try and survive a very determined bunch, almost an impossible thing to do on these roads, which, as I say, he knows them well, and he knows that they're long and straight, 10 seconds is the gap, the others are back and they broke away at 88 to go and he's just on uh, 12 kilometres from the line. Tricky roads too now, you can see they've just got a slight covering of moisture over them. Once we do get into town, it is going to be quite treacherous for the men on the front end of the main field. And again, 
Robbie McEwen riding very close to the front on the right hand side there. Well, I, they're hopefully riding out of this rain shower. The roads are still wet because, as I say, they're not far from us now. And the rain is looking like rain, but it's still dry at the finish line. And I think the rain would make a very different finish because the roads obviously will become a little bit slick and there are some nasty turns as they line up for the finishing straight. I'm afraid, Jackie, the end of a long, long breakaway, some 70 kilometres ahead today as now the race is all together and the sprinters can start sharpening those legs. Danilo Hondo is the German national champion in the white jersey, but Mapea now starting to lift up the pacemaking. Well, you see how fast these riders are going now. We talk of the fast sprinters, but they've got to keep themselves in position to use their fast sprint. And there's so many counter-attacks here. Three kilometers to go. That's still a long way from the finish for the sprinters to get it right. They don't want to be seen on the front yet. One Mape rider has said, that's enough for me. That was Andrea Taffy, he's done his job, he took the pace up, he strung them out into a big long line. The reason for doing that is to stop your sprinter getting swamped. You want to keep him as clear as possible for riders moving up round the outside. Oscar Freire on the left-hand side of the road there in the World Champions jersey. Danilo Hondo looking very comfortable, starting to take up the pace, making its lotto. Hondo is ideally placed right now in fourth position. Third position there is Rolf Aldag right behind his teammates and I would say that must be Gian Matteo Fernini on the wheel of Hondo is the green jersey of Eric Zabel. I can't see Robbie McCune anywhere for the moment. He may well have got swamped. Ludo Dirksen's in the middle for Lamprey in the pink and blue jersey. Two kilometres to go. Well, Eric is a brilliant competitor. He will not take defeat lightly. There's McEwen, though. He's just passed out of view, but he's over to the left of our picture, about four men down. I've noticed Freire is there as well, and also Baden Cuck is right tucked in too, very close to Eric Zabel. The three Aussies are ganging up on him again. Unbelievable. Three Aussies are going to take on the German Eric Zabel, the leader in the green jersey points competition at the start of today. Francis Dijon, that's Guedon in the white jersey, looking over his shoulder. Where's Brad McGee? Where's his teammate? Where's Baden Cook? They want to get Cook into the last 500 metres in an ideal position. Aldag now is taking up second place. Hondo is there in third place. Moving around the outside is Betoliati as well for Lamprey Dakin. There is Robbie Hunter too, right in the middle. He's looking for the world champion, Oscar Ferreira. They're coming into one of these very dangerous little traffic circles. In a few moments' time, they will be looking to see the Flamme Rouge, the red kite indicating 1,000 metres to go, and there it is. What a superb approach to line this is by the stars of the tour. Here comes Ludo Dirksen now. McEwen checks himself in the centre screen there. Baden Cook is also off to the left of, uh, left of our picture, to the right of McEwen. The peloton are out of it now, and glad to be, I think, this is a vicious finish today. Dirksen has got the front. Danilo Honda looks over his shoulder. He's looking for the whereabouts of Zabel as the sprint now starts. And this is going to be a very, very difficult sprint. It's Fabio Baldato trying for the run here now. He hasn't got the legs. Very, very sharp right hand. The Honda round in second place. Zabel not quite there on the train just yet. As our camera tries to catch up now, Baldato in trouble, I think. This is going to be the final run for the line now. It's the champion of Germany leading out here. Then it'll be Gian Matteo Fagnini. Zabel is there in fourth place. The left of the picture, Teddy Agricoli is trying. Now, Robbie McEwen has got the wheel, but watch out for Freire. Freire is on the wheel of Zabel. Zabel is leading out the world champion. McEwen is trying on the left. McEwen and Zabel. This is going to be McEwen again. Right on the line. Zabel has got him. Zabel has taken him on the line. And that is how you say I'm still in this bike race. Well, he was very confident there, Phil. I tell you what, I wouldn't have wanted to lift my hands up into the air that close to the line. Oh, but he's lost his breath there. He's crashed into one of the soigneurs. But what a great sprint. That's why this man is one of the best sprinters in the world. He came through there, perfectly set up by his team. And he said, OK, Robbie, you want to take me on? Well, come off my wheel right now. But this today was an Eric Zabel finish. Absolute perfection by Team Telecom. Tactically, they've got everything right today and they came up with the goods. Well, you don't win six consecutive green jerseys without showing a little aggression now and again, and Zabel clearly isn't ready to concede his possible seventh. Robbie McEwen was left to ponder the if-onlys. Oh, if I started in his wheel, yeah, I could have. I came from uh, you know, a good five, six metres behind him and uh, finished next to him. But, uh, you know, in, in the Tour, to be able to pass, especially from a lead-out like that, you, you have to be able to start you know, right behind him. And, uh, 
I couldn't get that position today. Ferreira had the wheel and he always leaves it late and he left it too late. I just had to go myself and it was a bit too far and the legs weren't that fantastic. And McEwen, as you can see from the stage result, ended up third, eventually separated from Oscar Freire by the photo finish. So Eric Zabel, who started the day in green by just two points, finished in green by seven after a short detour into second place out on the road. I must say I'm very happy now to win a stage uh, on, uh, on this way. But I think so, so uh, uh, you were right, uh, Robbie McEwen is uh, from the wheel. Uh, mostly from my wheel, one of the fastest guys. This year it's very hard for me to win uh, when I uh, start in front. As we indicated at the top of the show, all that excitement left the race for the yellow jersey completely untouched. No change in the time gaps at the top, and on page two, David Miller losing no time despite his crashes. Tor Hushoft remains the last man in the race, but there are now two men fewer. Rick Verbrugger failed to start this morning after his shoulder injury in yesterday's crash, and Alexander Schaefer of Kazakhstan was the badly hurt rider in the crash today inside the last 30 kilometers. He has facial injuries, he's in hospital, not badly hurt, but out of the tour. Saint Michel, where the tour came in 1990 and had to stop halfway across the causeway because the race was bigger than the island and couldn't physically get on. Stage seven brought the tour to the Normandy coast. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano was still comfortably in the yellow jersey, but Lance Armstrong was just seven seconds back and looking two stages ahead to the individual time trial. Well, there's today's obstacle course, 176 kilometers from Bagnol de Lorne to Avranches. A couple of fourth category climbs along the way and another 53 possible points on offer for the sprinters in the green jersey competition. In yellow for the third day, Igor Gonzalez de Galtiano, of course, would have a full complement of Onse bodyguards, including the man in second place behind him, Joseba Belocchi. They remain just ahead of Lance Armstrong and they'd probably stay there until the end of the time trial on stage nine. David Miller's crashes fortunately hadn't cost him any time, he was still 23rd, but crashes had cost the race a few riders, with the total now down to 185, of which Tor Hushoft was last. First in the points rankings this morning, as he has been since the end of stage one, was Eric Zabel. After yesterday's stage win, he started seven points ahead of Robbie McEwen, with Oscar Freire third, and Baden Cook and Stuart O'Grady giving Australia three of the top five. Well, today's escape committee was three strong. Anthony Morau of Credit Agricole, Domo's Leon Van Bon, and Frank Renier of the Bonjour team. Between them, they built up a lead of more than five minutes and in the process mopped up all the intermediate sprints, so no change in the green jersey competition out on the road. No competition at all for the strangest shot of the day. David Echebarria working on his aerodynamics in advance of the time trial. And it might have had something to do with the second strangest shot, because it came just after Echebarria got a 25 mile an hour peck on the cheek from Roberto Liseca. The first crash of the day wasn't a serious one, but it left Jonathan Vorters seriously adrift of the bunch because his bike was more seriously damaged than he was. Alessio driving the race on here now, Telecom willing to work, hoping that Zabel can have those ageing legs of his and the more stamina than the lesser ageing legs of Oscar Freire and uh, Robbie McEwen in the sprint. A lot of people, Paul, are saying that this could be the finish for Baden Cook. Well, I think it might be just a little bit too difficult. There are so many other guys who have got the power to get up that climb. Watch out for Freddy Rodriguez as well, the American former two-time champion. He'll be looking for a win today, and I had noticed a lot of the Domo Farm Freaks team jerseys were moving to the front end of the pack as well. There's, There's a crash. crash. There's a crash. Now, this is amazing. At the same time, every day, we have a pile-up in the peloton, and this again is a situation... Have a look and see if any of the riders who are high in the overall standings have been caught out. Number 12 there for Team Telecom is Rolf Aldag. He's a big worker. Again there, Christoph Agnoluto, AG2R, number 182. He is down. It looks as if there's a large, tall, Credi Agricole rider. That may be Jonathan Vorters, again having a bad day. He's gone, Paul, Marco Serpolini, and there's somebody oh, the world, world champion, champion is down. Oscar oh. Freire has taken a very nasty fall. Now, this is a man whose whole career has been dogged by physical problems 
and this is extremely sad and it's his back again it's his back that has given him the problems in the past there's somebody else right underneath him from Lamprey down there well, that, he just popped his head up for the last minute that uh, that is ditch is rather thing. deeper than it appears it seems a lot of riders are down here and delayed oh. and Christoph Moreau 61 is down as well this is bad there's Jonathan Vorters Stewie O'Grady is there as well I think on the left hand side you can see that a lot of men have gone down Frederick Bessie number 52 the Credit Agricole riders all here waiting for their leader and Christoph Moreau I think more dejected psychologically here Phil than anything else but just how many Credit Agricole riders fell down because I don't think they're waiting for I think they must have been almost all riding together as they crashed obviously Moreau is down looking very cool and collected the rider on the right Roger Leger won't believe this attending all of his team Freire looks as though he might be on his way but he's back and this is a serious problem for Oscar. His back has been a problem, and now he looks as though he's given a real good clout in that ditch. Well, he's a man I thought would be capable of getting up this climb towards the finish, and that is going to change the complete physiognomy of the race finish here right now because he's a tough guy at the end of the day. Moreau is up and riding. There's a guy down on the ground there, and I think that is Didier Roos, in fact. Before this Didier Roos, the former national champion of France. He's been involved in several crashes since the start, and this one doesn't look too good. The way no. he's holding his arm there right now, it looks as if it might be a collarbone problem there. Well, three days running, let's hope that's the end of it. Now as we leave them behind, desperate straight to the front as well. The latest gap is 18 seconds. Anthony Moran won't know half of his team, not half, three quarters, are all lying on the road at a couple of kilometres behind him as he hangs on to the front we're getting towards the desperate climb to the finish now and it's going to happen on the hill we're all talking to you from the ridge in the distance that is where they're racing to and they have to climb up to reach us it won't be long before they're on the climb now it's just on 18 seconds now it is 13 seconds and there has this well we've gone back to Didier Roos here and it yes they are saying that he has broken his collarbone well, that is amazing. Didier Roos is out of the tour, and he's going to the ambulance here. When you look at this, though, Phil, you realise how important it is to ride in the front 15 or 30 places of the main field. That's why these guys are taking the risk. That was a very narrow road there, and somebody was obviously taking a risk around the outside to try and get themselves to the front end of the main field. There is Van Bon, and there is the main peloton at the moment. It's all pink on the front of that main peloton. It is Team Telecom trying to drag them back. There's the attack. A little attack coming there, but very quickly manoeuvred there by Van Bon straight onto the wheel. Runier, this is a last-ditch effort for him because when he hits that hill, it's going to hurt. Well, in the distance is the three-kilometre banner. The official time check under it is 13 kilometres. We've just started the slopes now. Renier, the man who started it all at the 22nd kilometre today, is trying now desperately to finish it off. And the peloton, disorganised by the third crash in as many days, where riders have gone out with broken bones, are now coming at a gallop. But they're not there yet, but they will be soon. Leon van Bonn has gone to the front. He may as well try something because they're coming very, very There's close. Another crash at the it back sounds here. like another crash call. That we're getting all this information from Race Radio, the Race Referees Channel. This is in French. And you can see these guys now raising the white flat. And in fact, Jalabert. Jalabert has gone down, number 51. So again, chaos. And there are a lot of US Postal jerseys there too. This is a big rider. Well, they've got Ekimov down nearest. And Ekimov. He's looking Armstrong. after Armstrong, Armstrong has well. gone down as well. He's not crashed, but he had a slight problem here. This is number one. This is the defending champion right now. He's inside two and a half kilometres to go. Armstrong is up and riding. The race referee's car is by him. This is why the Tour de France over the first ten days is so very dangerous and precarious. There was Georgie Hincapi, but you know what? Armstrong is going to fly up through this field. He looked all right to me. There was no problem to his bike at all. And here's the last-minute attack. Well, Armstrong has got to get on because uh, he'll lose time here. This race will be split time today. The riders will split up on the climb. A lot of effort being done there by Armstrong and his team to bring them back together as we now have an attack here. It's coming from Faster Portolo. And these are the attacks where we'd expect them to come because this is a long, nasty climb up towards the finish. 
This is a tough climb. This is the time when you can actually hit the sprinters hard and fast right now. But the drama, I think, really is at the back end of the main field. Look at this. U.S. Postal Service today are what being asked by Lance time. Armstrong to pull him back into the main peloton. This man going clear at the front here is Marco Velo of Faso Bortolo. He's only got himself 20 or 30 metres advantage. It's the pink jerseys of Team Telecom on the front setting the tempo. This is the worst possible time for Armstrong to crash and have an incident. He has got to claw his way back up here. But you know what, Phil? Looking at him there, he is not panicking at all. He is very calm and very collected. He's using his team to pace him onto the tail of this main peloton. The attack now coming from David Echabaria from the Uscatel Uscadi team. He's the rider lost an overall chance in a crash himself early on in this tour. Uh, David Barrier, if he gets it, he's won a race on a similar climb like this in the past here, stage of the Tour de France. He's going to reach the breakaway man, Marco Velo. Velo hasn't won a time trial a race this year. At one kilometre to go, he's tipping over the summit now. He's on the flat and the peloton can reorganise themselves. And Echebrier takes a good look to see what he can do here. As they now, it is Daniel Hondo trying to organise the chase, but there's a definite split on now. Danilo Hondo on the front there in the white jersey, the yellow jersey, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano was very front. There's a lot of pressure at the back because Lance Armstrong has been involved in an incident just a few moments ago. Three of those guys have been pulled back into the fold, but there's a move going off the front right now by Mapeo. Lance Armstrong apparently 15 seconds behind the main peloton at the moment. Well, this looks like uh, Pedro Harillo is trying to slip away here for the Mape team. I might well surprise us with a surprise. Grab McGee there in second place. It is going there. The sprint has been spoilt here by this hill for sure at 400 metres. And I think this is Pedro Harillo. And if it is, and it doesn't matter who it is, it's a Mape rider who's going to get the sprint as he's being closed in by Bradley McGee. McGee is trying to reach him. He was the man that's supposed to lead out Baden Cup, but he's too strong. I think McGee might get his stage win here because he's closing very, very quickly. Pedro Herrillo is beginning to crack as the sprint is starting behind now. And as they kick behind, it looks as though McGee is going to get the victory of his life. Bradley McGee, the Australian, takes it on the line. And what an incredible result that was. Well, 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 Australia have got the win, but by the man we didn't really expect it to. He was supposed to lead out Baden Cook, and he rode the field off his wheel. Absolutely brilliant. Now, this is the group of Armstrong. Armstrong there with Andrea Taffy, Laurent Jalabert. These are the men who were involved in that crash. Let's have a quick look at the time. 26 seconds in arrears for Lance Armstrong today. 26 seconds is not a catastrophe, but it just goes to prove on the flat stages of the Tour de France. Well. You have to be attentive at all the times. Bradley, were you aware of the crashes that were going on behind you? Yeah, I was actually in one of them. I had a foot to the floor. Luckily, one of my teammates waited for me and got me back up there. Oh, that was that last one, uh, 5k to go. But uh, it was no problem. What does this mean to you today? I can't believe this is the biggest thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe it. It was the biggest disappointment ever for Pedro Orio, who thought he'd timed his burst to the line perfectly. Only to deflate in the last 10 metres when he turned and saw McGee powering past him. Hombre, pues sí, yo creo que las fuerzas las tengo como para ganar una etapa, pero pero las circunstancias nunca sabes cómo son, ¿no? Y desde luego la circunstancia era favorable para mí y y para desgracia de Oscar, pues esa caída suya pues me ha favorecido a mí, ¿no? Y y he tratado de intentarlo y la verdad es que es una tengo tengo una desilusión tremenda ahora mismo porque lo he visto tan cerca que so the yellow jersey competition, which was supposed to be in hibernation until the time trial, is suddenly all activity and time gaps. In fact, it's all on say. They've got the top seven places now, with Lance Armstrong slipping back to eight, 34 seconds behind Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. David Miller moves up a few spots, or rather a few crash victims slip behind him, and Christophe Moreau's nightmare tour continues, the erstwhile big French hope is now 136th, nearly 10 and a half minutes back. So Gonzalez de Galdiano will be in yellow for the fourth straight day tomorrow, and he now has a decent head start on Lance Armstrong for the individual time trial on Monday. The word on Armstrong, by the way, is that he didn't actually come off in the crash, just got blocked by a teammate who did. And the word from the US Postal Camp is that he'll be fit for what should be a fascinating showdown.
well the papers have caused a full of all of the crashes which are affecting the destiny of the riders in this race at the moment. We're losing most of the riders because of broken bones right now. This is Oscar Freer and as you say he's now out of the race and that's really sad. And of course Lance Armstrong gets the inside page because it's the first time in four years, Paul, that he's been involved in any sort of an accident. Well, he's ridden well over the last few years, kept himself out of all kinds of incident and accident, but in fact he didn't properly crash yesterday. It was his teammate Roberto Heras who fell onto his back wheel. Heras's handlebars were caught in the wheel of Armstrong. Armstrong had to put his foot on the ground, was delayed but managed to get up and started riding again, but I think uh, a little bit more scared than anything else. Yeah, well he lost 27 seconds, not a disaster, but it just shows you how easily you can lose the Tour de France. Today's stage was the third longest of the tour, just over 217 kilometres with three fourth category climbs and like yesterday, the last of them on the run in which was likely to make things interesting. Big crowds out for Bastille Day and the big guns were out for the first intermediate sprint. Robbie McEwen beat Eric Zabel to it and that cut the Germans lead in the points competition to three. The first successful attack of the day had seven men in it, three Frenchmen, three Dutchmen and a Latvian. The race behind is not closing in. 2.52 is the gap at four kilometres to go. Decker, and this is the top, has now suffered enough to stay with them. And I think it's because the other six have tried all... And here he goes. Eric is putting in an attack. Can you believe that? Uh, Belovic has seen the move and he's trying to catch him. Now you see the benefit of two teammates because Karsten Kroon is splitting up the rest. That's guts. That is sheer yep, guts absolutely. when you do that because this man knows that he's nailed. He knows his legs are on the point of popping right now. But he decided this is the Tour de France. I'm just going to see if I can catch him unawares. And Sebastian Eno was ready for that move. Four stage wins in the last two years for Eric Decker. He has ridden at the Tour de France on nine occasions. And only once has he failed to finish. Well, that was a great move by Eric Decker there. Watch out at the back, though. There's Cerves Carnarvon. He's a very rapid man. He's teeing himself up for a counter-attack in a few moments' time. Carsten Kroon, a former wearer of the King of the Mountains jersey at the Giro d'Italia. He's never been a great, successfully, great, successful professional bike rider. The only win I think he's ever had in his career was the Grand Prix of giving him. Bilosovic is off now. But shadowed immediately by Carsten Kroon. Rabobank are using all of the tactics now. The strength of the extra man. And Belofajic, well, you're never going to beat them by riding off the front. Decker is gritting his teeth, but he's not going to get dropped now, and you suddenly get that feeling. Once at the banner, there is the banner as they spin for the small prize at the top of the hill, which none of them are bothered about. They're thinking of the finished prize, and once over the top, the road will start to go downhill, and Decker will rejoin. Well, I know you're not supposed to take sides, but I'm kind of hoping Eric Decker gets the win today because he really has shown us what courage is all about. He's been dropped so many times, but watch out. Cerves Canavan moves forward. He wants the win this time to go to Holland. This is a great acceleration. He's being nailed slowly but surely by Milosevic. The gap is there for the moment, but they have to keep the pressure on. Decker's on the back, almost onto the tail there of... Stefan Auger, the Jean de la Tour rider, and Carnarvon knows that it's all back together. Well, in all honesty, there can't be much left in the legs of these riders. They have thrown in one attack after the other. One of them, though, will work. And now watch for these boys in the orange stripes, because here comes another run. And goodbye, Eric, again. Now, which one is going? It's got to be Sebastian Eno. The local man is chasing Decker this time. And the others have faltered. The gap is there. Shortly we'll be going downhill. And it's the Breton who reaches Decker first. Well, Eno you know, on the wheel there of Decker. They've got the gap right now. They are forcing the Latvian rider to set all of the pacemaking. He's not going to enjoy this at all. But if he wants to fit, win this stage, he has to pull them back slowly but surely. They're all queuing up on his wheel right now. Karsten Kroon is there in second position. Cerves Carnarvon will try and recuperate a little bit in the slipstream of everybody else and hope that it all comes back together and slows down so he can launch one more attack. Hats off to Eric Decker, 104, the blue white and orange jersey of Rabobank. He's launched the attack after being dropped on numerous occasions. 
but he's going to get caught now by the Latvian. But there will be another attack and another after that till somebody breaks the string. Here we go, down towards the finish now. Decker is on the front. Moments ago was off the back. Belofajic refuses to give up. I don't know how many times he's attacked. Uh, but racing off the front, you're wasting your time. The riders can see you, they can mark you. You watch where the Dutch attack from, and they come from the back. Another attack, it looks like uh, it's gone again. It could well be Kenaven who's gone. This long, long line of people just seeing a wonderful race here, and they're now a kilometre to go. To forget the race behind, they're racing now for eighth place in the peloton. Well, Frank Renier's been the aggressive man of the Tour de France so far. He's the most aggressive bike rider in the event since we lent Luxembourg. There are three Dutchmen in this group right now. The leading group is seven men strong. They have thrown absolute caution to the wind this afternoon. They've launched attack after attack, and it is finally going to come down to a sprint for the line. But Milosevic is on the left-hand side. He's gone, and I think he might have hit them hard. Well, he's gone again off to the left. Decker's hooked up to his wheel. Who else would it be? Frank Rainier, the most aggressive rider of the Tour in his first Tour de France, is riding third wheel and he's looking very promising. They call him the Spider-Man. Well, he's got everybody in his web. Can he get them out of it? Because leading up to the line now is Velocity. Now comes Decker on the left of the picture. is Eno now. And Eno and Decker, where is he finding the strength from? As this is going to be a tight sprint. Is it a successful David Decker? My goodness me, no. It is Carsten Kroon, his teammate. That is an immense result. Well, that was unbelievable. We were looking at Decker. Decker was, had the Carnarvon on his wheel, and boom, up the inside came Carsten Kroon. Absolutely unbelievable. Great work there by the Dutchman. They took it all away from the French on Bastille Day, and the win has gone to Holland. <laughs> unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, in case you thought we'd forgotten about the rest of the Tour de France, here they are. They will not know the drama up front, but now they're trying for the move that will race them into eighth place. Well, it looks as though this might be for Baden Cup. Brad McGee took it yesterday for La Française de Jeu. Only the fifth ever Australian to win a stage of the Tour de France. Danilo Hondo looking over at Andrea Taffe. And even going forward at the moment is Ludo Dix. But here comes McGee, bringing up the charge now behind as well. And watch the left of your picture. He's got Baden Cook in his slipstream. Dixon's going in the middle now as they make it to the line. This is going to be a tremendous sprint. As they come up towards the line now, Robbie McEwen is coming one-on-one -on -one with Zabel. McEwen gets it. And in the process, he nipped another point off Eric Zabel, whose lead in the green jersey competition is now down to two. Behind them, the rest of the Rabobank team was sprinting too. Not that they were bothered about their placings on the stage. They just wanted to get to Carsten Kroon. Let's have a look at the result then. Carsten Kroon with a stage win on his debut tour, but profiting from the heroics of his veteran teammate Eric Decker, who came in third. Cervais Carnarvon was no doubt less than overjoyed to be the second Dutchman in a 1-2-3 for Holland. And the three behind them even less pleased to be a 4-5-6 for France. All the other major players finished safely in the bunch. The story of the day, though, was the Dutch double act. The old lag everyone was looking to for the final sprint, and the new boy, he helped catapult past them all for the win, and onto the podium. So Carsten Kroon took the stage, but a lot of the plaudits had to go to Decker. He didn't get his hat-trick, but he'll definitely claim the assist. No crashes today to distort the standings, so it's as you were. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano and six of his teammates ahead of Lance Armstrong, with this morning's time gaps maintained all the way down the line. So Gonzalez de Galdiano will take a lead of 34 seconds over Armstrong into tomorrow's individual time trial, probably the most important day of his career. Sí, una cita con el destino y con la contrarreloj. Una contrarreloj importante para mí, para todo el equipo y para los adversarios también. Igor, más de medio minuto le separa de Armstrong. Eh, primera cosa, ¿usted cree que, puede, que, que usted puede ganar el contrarreloj? Segunda cosa, 37 segundos creo que le separa de Armstrong. ¿Van a ser suficientes para darle eh, el jersey amarillo en las montañas? Suficiente, no sé. Yo creo que el, yo intentaré hacer una buena contrarreloj. El problema es que Armstrong... También es muy bueno en la contrarreloj, incluso hasta ahora en el Tour ha sido el mejor. Tanto es una incertidumbre. Yo espero hacer la buena y a partir de ahí veremos el resultado.